tension pneumothorax is like those prehistoric giant massive drawings figures on the sides of the hills you cannot really see them unless you have a proper perspective like now you may think that i'm in the middle of nowhere whilst actually i'm next to the biggest british penis ever my name is alex hepner and this is a group call Hi guys, and thank you for tuning in. Today, let me share my personal view on tension pneumothorax. It is quite a complex topic, I agree, but I feel that we can summarize it in three simple steps. One, pathophysiology. Two, prevalence. Three, signs, symptoms, and treatment. Let's find out. Tension pneumothorax develops when injured tissue forms a one-way valve allowing air inflow with inhalation into the pleural space and prohibiting air outflow. As a result, pressure rises within the affected hemithorax. In simple words, as the air enters the chest cavity, one lung collapses and the second lung and all the internal organs in the chest cavity, including heart and the major vessels, are compressed and it causes obstructive shock. See, it's simple. When you think tension pneumothorax, you think predominantly major trauma, blunt trauma to the chest, gunshots, or penetrating injury like stabbings. So all those cases when an object of fractured rib pierces the lung. And that's fine, but we should also remember that spontaneous pneumothorax can progress to tension pneumothorax. And this should open our eyes to patients after acupuncture, pregnant, artificially ventilated ICU patients, COVID patients, and last but not least, newborn, as aspirated meconium may act as one-way valve and produce a tension pneumothorax in newborns. And that's why I started this episode comparing tension pneumothorax to, to the giant prehistoric figures, drawings on the hill. Sometimes it's so big and obvious, but we just don't see them. The funny thing is that all those posh courses we attend, on all those posh courses we are told that tension pneumothorax patients will have extended jugular veins, will have um, tracheal deviation, or at least low SpO2. Actually, bullshit. Universal findings for all tension pneumothorax patients are only respiratory distress and the chest pain. Then common findings, so up to 70% cases, are tachycardia and ipsilateral decreased uh, entry. So all those symptoms you've been taught before, like low SpO2, tracheal deviation or hypotension, you can come across in less than 25% of your patients with tension pneumothorax. And, you know, the, the, the famous hyperresonance or percussion occur in less than 10% of patients with tension pneumothorax. Uh, distended jugular veins or surgical emphysema, which again uh, are taught to the first year students, occurs only in less than 20% of patients, but predominantly in artificial, artificially ventilated patients. So you most likely won't see it in field. I remember my patients with tension pneumothorax, there was no distended jugular veins, uh, there was no surgical emphysema, but definitely I remember they were in respiratory distress and they had a massive chest pain. Treatment. How to treat tension pneumothorax? Simply, you need to let the air out of uh, the uh, chest cavity and you can do it with the finger thoracostomy, you can do it with the tube thoracostomy uh, or you can do it simply with a needle decompression and that's, um, we go, that's something we're going to focus on. So first, three sides we should consider to actually decompress the chest. So first, let's think about mid-clavicular line. That's a mid-clavicular line and you want to aim for a second intercostal space on the uh, top of the third rib. Why on the top of the third rib, not on the bottom of the rib? Because we want to actually stay away from nerve bundles and um, vascular bundles that are on the bottom of every single rib. So again, mid-clavicular line, second intercostal space on the top of the 
third three. The second uh, landmark or, or second um, point we should consider is mid axillary line. And for mid axillary line, you want to think about fourth or fifth intercostal space. And the last one is anterior auxiliary line, anterior auxiliary line, and again it's fourth and fifth intercostal space. Now we have our landmarks, uh, let's think about equipment. Uh, this is standard 14 um, gauge uh, cannula and this is dedicated needle for chest decompression. Let me open both of them, you will see the difference. The dedicated chest decompression needle is far longer and the lumen of the device, let me compare, let me show you, the lumen of the device is is far bigger. But there's more to the game, think about chest wall thickness. So a study published in 2016 shows that average chest wall thickness uh, for the patient whose BMI is 26 is approximately 4.5 centimeters, whilst um, chest wall thickness for the mid axillary line is approximately 3.8 centimeters. So you have uh, more chances to get into the pleural cavity, into the pleural, pleural space uh, using um, the mid axillary um, line. Now let's decompress the chest. Let's use the orange cannula because that's most likely what you will have. Remove the lead from the top of the cannula. Uh, now you want a 10 ml syringe um, with sodium chloride. You want to leave some air here. Pop the syringe on the top of the cannula and now you want to go with your mid clavicular line second intercostal space on the top of the third rib and go 90 degrees you should see bubbles in the syringe i remember when i um, decompressed the chest of my patient i've seen lots of bubbles here remove the syringe now secure the uh, cannula you can use the veca fix for it or you can use the tape just to keep it stable like that and that's the same if you want to use different access so let's say fourth or fifth intercostal space mid axillary line go 90 degrees uh, you want to see the bubbles in the syringe uh, that's the sign that you are in plural cavity and now you want to disconnect the syringe and uh, let the air out. Uh, if you want to use different needles, so the large needle I showed you before, that's the, the, the thing is absolutely same. Uh, just remember to secure the um, ending of the cannula, the tip of the cannula uh, with the tape and make a note that it is actually a tension pneumothorax uh, valve, nothing else. As a last thing, remember chest decompression is an AGP, so now in COVID times and you need a level 3 PPE for it. Uh, do not try to perform this uh, procedure without PPE level 3. Okay guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, also, I know there are many details we did not discuss in this video, but it is not that important. The most important thing, guys, is think outside of the box looking for the tension pneumothorax. Remember, look for the giant on the hill. Many thanks. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.